Oh, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of New Mexico Mercury. Uh, I'm here today with Paul Robinson, an old friend and research director at uh, the Southwest Research and Information Center in Albuquerque and an international authority on uranium mining and uranium processing. It's really great to have you here with us today, Paul. Well, I appreciate the invitation. Uh, it's a good opportunity to talk about uh, interesting subjects. It's quite important to New Mexico. And that interesting material just happens to be uh, uranium. Um, a couple of weeks ago, you wrote in the pages of the, of the Mercury about a most curious development at the uranium producers in America, uh, in which uh, somehow an executive from the Russian Atomic Ministry was elected president of that organization. I'm wondering if you could explain to us a little bit about how such a thing could happen and what that actually means. Well, it is a very interesting uh, development, uh, and uh, it's one that uh, I think uh, reflects on what constitutes a uranium development uh, issues in in New Mexico, in the, in the country, so it's a uh, uh, decision by an organization that's not isolated from what's going on. Uh -huh. The uh, Uranium Producers of America it describes itself as an association of companies involved in uranium development here in this country. And it includes companies that are producing uranium as well as those who that have properties that are interested in producing. In the U.S., uh, most of the uranium that's mined is mined by companies that are owned in Canada or Russia or other countries. Wow. There are very few U.S.-based producers hmm. that are U.S.-based uh, companies. And uh, the company that uh, was, uh, who had an executive elected to the uranium producer's head office is called Uranium One. Okay. And that Uranium One uh, has uh, some production in Texas. It has some other proposed uh, uh, developments. And it's uh, owned by the Russian Atomic Ministry. That's why this really weird. And it has been for uh, several years. The majority share has been owned by the Russian Atomic Ministry. And just in the last several months, the ministry has agreed to let itself acquire the rest of the company. Uh -huh. So uh, the uranium one has gone from being what it described itself as the largest publicly traded uranium company in America is now wholly privately owned and no longer publicly traded. Uh -huh. uh, there are a few Russian government ministries that are publicly traded right. <laughs> corporations, of course. So uh, it's a... Uh, development that, ha uh, that uh, doesn't uh, provide uh, insight into what uh, Uranium One's plans are or what the Russian Atomic Ministry's plans are, uh, because they're an organization, of course, that's uh, vertically integrated throughout the atomic cycle. They don't just mine. Right, they do everything. Most of the uranium miners uh, are more limited in their scope. So is this just a completely off-the-wall thing to have a to have an officer of a Russian ministry be the president of an American uranium producers association, or is this a kind of an indication of how international uh, this whole this whole question of uranium mining is, and processing, and milling, and refining, and redeveloping, and 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 all all the enormous complexities of, uh, that go along with this mineral. Uh, there's nothing uh, random or casual, I don't think, about this uh, action. The, the Uranium Producers of America's office is in the office of the law firm that represents most of the uranium pro uh, producers or property wannabe producers in New Mexico. Uh, and uh, the firms are not without uh, other things to do, so it's not just a voluntary effort involved in a couple of uh, conference junkets. Mm -hmm. uh, and it does very much indicate the international nature of uranium production and uranium uh, ownership and plans here in this country. The largest producer of uranium in the U.S. is uh, Cameco, a Canadian firm that's based in Saskatchewan. Uh -huh. And it produces uh, more than half of the uranium currently mined in the U.S. Wow. Uh, energy fuels, uh, 
owns the one operating uranium mill in the U.S. and their uh, uh, Toronto Stock Exchange traded uh, Canadian firm. Uh, they, uh, uh, the Cameco uranium is produced by in situ methods where solutions are injected into the ground and pumped out and the uranium is separated out of that solution so there's no mill, there's just injection of uh, material into groundwater resources. And uh, potential contamination of it. Uh, contaminations occurred at most of the in situ sites. Uh, the permits generally allow contamination up to a standard and there's special alternative concentration limits allowed at sites. So uh, communities that are seeking to have affected waters restored to pre-mining conditions seldom can have their goals established as standards, much less attained. So we know in New Mexico uh, the great problem with uranium mining of any kind has been its uh, mining waste and its milling waste and the potential for contamination of groundwater through NC2 leaching. Uh, we also know from watching operations of any corporate uh, system that uh, many times the company comes in, does its job, and leaves its waste for somebody else to clean up. Does the international quality of uranium operations around the world now leave localities more vulnerable to having waste just dumped on them and never uh, cleaned up and having to have taxpayers or whoever's paying it uh, uh, do it for the companies? New Mexico faces a legacy of uranium mining and milling waste that dates back to the 40s. Right. Uh, some of those sites have been, uh, through different remediation uh, efforts, some have been completed, some are still leaking, so the legacy is not over. Right. Uh, there hasn't been any uranium production since uh, the mills were torn down in the early 90s. So there's not a uh, second wave yet. Right. And so whether the next wave, if it occurs, uh, would involve uh, a legacy that's unaddressed, that's a question that a lot of people in the uranium-affected communities raise because sure. they want to see the legacy cleaned up before their startup. Again. Uh, saying that we won't make those problems is one kind of promise to hear. Right. Saying that we have cleaned up the old problems, that's not true yet. And there's a lot of money being spent on that and the problems of the abandoned uranium mines, inactive uranium mines, have been largely ignored during the uh, 50 years of mining. And it's the mill tailings that right. have been the focus. But the, the mine sites are sources of release and they're in areas where they're not uh, often fenced off so there's been exposures to people and livestock and there's been some research that's shown uh, a correlations of kidney disease with proximity to uranium mines and uh, uranium itself is a kidney seeker and more hazardous as a chemical contaminant than as a radionuclide. That's so heavy. Uh, well the uh, function, the chemical function, oh, okay. is uh, what ha what causes the uh, interruption of some of the kidney function. Uh, so the radon is a radioactive gas that uranium decays into. Right. Uh, radium is also part of the uranium decay chain. But the chemical hazards are uh, part of the exposure that at mines... Uh, more than mill sites because it's the uranium that's removed the mill. Right, All right. the other contaminants, the radionuclides, as well as heavy metals associated with the ore, they're left in the tailings. So uh, legacy waste, which is kind of a poetic way to talk about something really pretty hideous, uh, has uh, caused a tremendous amount of, of pain and suffering to lots of Native American populations in New Mexico to Navajos, to Akamas, to Lagunas who used to work in mines and, and around tailing sites and who, and who still live around, uh, around those sites. Uh, I read somewhere that, that uh, the Navajo, uh, prior to uranium mining, were not known to have any kind of cancers associated with their populations. So I guess I want to get a, a clearer picture 
in your mind of what the magnitude of, of the health risks of these old sites are and why it's so important to clean them up before you begin to add new ones. The exposures at abandoned mines now, abandoned uranium mines now, are to people who live near those mines or might be grazing livestock or using water supplies near those mines. Right. The exposure that has led to a uh, uh, significant uh, increase in lung cancer among Navajo uh, people sampled is a uranium worker study. Right, right, okay. So the miners themselves and the mill workers, the ore transportation workers, they're uh, uh, the ones that have been studied well, right. well enough to identify a, uh, health effects associated with their work. Right. And that's been used to establish a radiation exposure compensation program for those workers. But they only are covered if they've worked up to 1971. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Because that's when the U.S. government stopped purchasing uranium, right. and that's when the commercial market began. And so the government is only accepting compassionate compensation claims. They're not admitting liability. It's a uh, compassionate no response. Uh, and so that's been going on for uh, since 1990 is when the first Radiation Exposure Compensation Act was passed. Amendments in 2000. There's a new uh, legislation been introduced to extend that date beyond 71. So there's a post-71 uh, cohort of uh, workers and families who think they ought to be covered, including people in New Mexico. Sure. And uh, so that legislation's been introduced in the most recent Congress. Uh, so the... Uh, New proposals in, for uranium development are proposals that are places where uranium was identified back in the 60s, mm. back in the first generation or second generation of mining, and weren't uh, commercial enough to be mined then and have yet to show that they're commercial properties uh, these days. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, There's... Uh, uh, I grew up in Baltimore along Pimlico Road and near the Preakness, and so we can use a horse racing analogy. And there's a race that involves the Rokahonda mine, the Mount Taylor uranium mine, the uh, HRI uh, Church Rock, and the HRI Ciboyeta all mines, in all in New Mexico, and all have said they want to mine have filed applications with either the state or federal agencies, depending on the land status. So the Roca Honda mine has a draft environmental impact statement that, that's currently, in April uh, 2013, open for public comment. Oh, good. And it's uh, a property that was explored by Kermagee in the 60s, mm -hmm. and it's on... Uh, uh, Two of the three sections of the property are on the National Forest, and one is state land. Mm -hmm. And the two sections are primarily uh, almost uh, totally within the Mount Taylor traditional cultural property, oh boy. which is a federal designation of a cultural site that provides for consultation but doesn't uh, serve as a, a barrier to the Forest Service's uh, decision-making. So Strathmore Minerals owns the majority of that Roca Honda Resources company that's developing the mine. Mm -hmm. Strathmore is based in Canada. In Canada. Their 40% partner is Sumitomo Heavy Industries in of Japan. 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 And there's an agreement from 2007 when the uranium price was $137 a pound for that partnership. Now the price is at 40 40 and a quarter. 40 and a quarter. And whether uh, Sumitomo still has the uh, interest in uh, bankrolling the project or not is, is, is unclear. Uh, Strathmore's share price is at its lowest ever, wow. struggling to stay above 10 cents and was in the three, four dollar range. Wow. Wow. So if one is looking at the economic impact of uranium mine speculation, it's the economic loss of the investors. Right. 
these companies have been mining investors. They right. haven't been able to mine uranium, and uh, the losses are huge for the, the individuals or institutions that are investing in these firms. So Strathmore is relying on Sumitomo funds wow. to help it get through the licensing stage. Whether their economic analyses, their technical analyses of the deposit, says they need a $75 a pound price to be profitable. Wow. And it hasn't been, uh, the world hasn't been able to sustain a uranium price above 60 ever for more than a few months at a time. It's never been above those prices. So it's, uh, there's, uh, miners are always uh, looking at the uh, gold at the uh, end of the rainbow and uh, haven't learned that the rainbow is always moving, depending on where you're standing. It's always going to be moving. It can't help itself. So, so uh, Strathmore and Roca Honda. The uh, um, other mine that had a draft environmental statement on it and is within the Mount Taylor Traditional Cultural Property on Forest Service land is the Laramide Resources Lahara Mine. Okay. And that also was explored back in the uh, uh, 60s and uh, even permitted by the Forest Service in the mid-70s, mid-80s, but never operated. And it's a Canadian firm with uh, holdings in Mongolia, among other places. The uh, Mount Taylor mine, which is the uh, already has a shaft sunk, wow. the other two have uh, uh, would need to, to drill a shaft. Or, uh, Mount Taylor mine, it has just announced it's going to go from standby to active status. It's wow. applied for that just in the last few weeks. And that's the largest uranium deposit in New Mexico, and it pumped out about 8,000 gallons per minute of water to drain the mine in order to allow workers in. Wow. Uh, the Roca Honda is proposing to pump on the order of 4,000 gallons per minute. Where does that water go? That water would be uh, discharged to the surface, uh, to the north of a divide there, into the San Lucas Canyon, onto the Lee Ranch property. Oh, yeah. And... Uh, under the Mine Dewatering Act, you don't have to have a water right. Uh, New Mexico has a special law called the Mine Dewatering Act that in 1984 allowed pumping without uh, uh, water right as, uh, as long as you don't have a consumptive use. Right, right. So dewatering the mine, that's a beneficial use because you can't mine without doing that, but not a consumptive. The water isn't consumed. So if the rancher decides to consume the water or water is used for uh, dust suppression on roads or uh, waste rock, then there might be a water right concern there. The Pueblo of Acoma is uh, challenged the water uh, withdrawal application uh, before the state engineer on the Roca Honda. Uh, Acoma was a, the tribal... Uh, a government that that uh, was in the lead on the traditional cultural property petition that was acted on by the state cultural resource uh, cultural properties review board and then uh, uh, overturned at the state level, but it still is established for the federal land right. in the forest. Let me ask you a kind so of so there's a few other horses in the race. Yes, but those are the lead hard rock mines, and Mount Taylor is owned by General Atomics which is a, a vertically diversified San Diego-based privately held company. Oh. They make drones, oh. among other things, and they own a uranium mill in Colorado that's on the Superfund site, the Cotter Corporation Mill. Mm. So uh, two years ago, uh, Cotter announced that they were going to be taking the Mount Taylor ore and reopening. Oh, yeah. state of Colorado says, no, we're not going to be relicensing production at this site. They're trying to get that cleaned up. Uh, the Cotter, along with the Homestake uh, mill site uh, at Milan and the Church Rock uh, mill site near uh, Gallup, those are the other Superfund listed uranium tailing sites. Some of the legacy that's yet to be cleaned up and all of them have alternative concentration limits, raising the standards to uh, make it easier to comply if the groundwater contaminants can never be diluted or drained out. So I'm reminded of what happened outside of outside of Moab, Utah, uh, with a large uh, mill tailing pile uh, by, I believe, an American company called Atlas Mining. 
who ended up cleaning that up was, of course, the taxpayer and, and is doing that right now. I'm always wondering if you have uh, in, uh, internationally held companies, foreign companies mining in a locality. What is their, what's their, their uh, payoff to actually do the cleanup? I mean, isn't it sort of more inevitable that, that uh, I know this is sounding a little paranoid, but isn't it more inevitable to have them just drop their stuff and leave after they made their bucks? So one of the lessons learned from past uranium mining, past mining, is to get the money first ah. before you issue the permit. Oh, boy, is that a... <laughs> so there are bonds or other kinds of surety that are in place to guarantee... Uh, reclamation in the event that uh, standards are not met or company goes bankrupt. And then there's long-term continued care funds that have been established. And so those would be required of the new sites and there are guarantees in place for the Homestake site Here. as well as the Church Rock. Whether those at the end of the day when reclamation is done and post-closure monitoring begins, whether they're going to be adequate, that's for the future. Oh my uh, okay. One example of a closed tailings pile is the former Anaconda mill tailings out at Blue Water in New Mexico, just west of Grants, and they've got uranium contamination that is rising in the last couple of years really? in some monitoring wells at the edge of that property. Huh. Tailings were dried out and covered with dirt and rock, but it overlays in a volcanic uh, aquifer, shallow oh, volcanic yeah. aquifer, yeah. and the San Andreas Glorieta aquifer, and both are showing some rising uranium levels. So the idea that uh, these really are radioactive waste repositories, and they really need to be contained for the long term with not just covers, oh, yeah. but also bottoms. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. No bottom at the Anaconda. And uh, people who lived near the Milan tailings pile, the Homestake, and near the Church Rock tailings pile, they want to see those moved to a prepared site. Ooh. They'd like to see them disposed of in a place as good as a new site would have. Wow. Not just accept these existing sites and compromise on the cost and save on the transportation, but do it right. Uh, there's a Blue Water Valley Downstream Alliance community that uh, uh, is part of the Milan area. They live next to that tailings pile. There's a Redwater Pond Road Community Association next to the Church Rock tailings pile, and they've been involved in some of EPA's decisions to reclaim the, uh, the mine waste in that area by putting it on top of the tailing site. Wow. Rather than moving the two of them to a new site, they're doubling up on wow. a site where, that had been leaking and where the dam broke, Jeez. break occurred. Uh, and those two groups are part of a statewide uh, coalition called a Multicultural Alliance for a Safe Environment. Good. So another one of the lessons learned from the communities is to be more organized and proactive. During the mining uh, phase when, when I was younger, uh, there wasn't a lot of community action from the tribal communities, the land grants, or uh, other communities. And now there's more uh, involvement uh, by the tribal leadership, many of whom are former miners or the children right. of miners right. who have an experience that they don't want to see their community relive. Absolutely. Uh, and then a lot of young people involved from those communities who don't uh, think the risk is worth taking. So it's a possibility that a new uranium boom in New Mexico is not going to happen anyway because we're already way overproduced uh, in terms of how much uranium we actually have. And there's not a very big likelihood, is there really, that we're going to produce many more reactors in this country? Most of the new reactors will probably be developed um, in China and, and India. But the question then remains, uh, we have... Uh, uranium is a lingering, uh, apparently an endlessly lingering problem. Um, so how do these things all sort of dovetail? The uranium activity that's been going on in New Mexico in the last eight or ten years has been a, 
uh, marketing boom. A marketing there's, there's a growth in the speculation about whether the uranium that's here is valuable or not. Uh, it's not a question of is there uranium that's been found. It's is it commercially viable? Uh -huh. Can it be mined at a profit? It's not a weapon uh, uh, related material uh, anymore. And that's because there was so much uranium mined back in the 50s and 60s that the U.S. had enough uranium for every bomb they could imagine building. <laughs> and that stockpile is what's used to supply a lot of U.S. reactors now. Right. We have weapon-grade uranium that's been blended down to reactor-grade, diluted by 30 times, and that's fueling the U.S. reactors now. Wow. And the U.S. has large uh, stockpiles of uranium enrichment tailings that could be re-enriched. One of the uh, projects in southeast New Mexico is a reconversion uh, project. Uh, so reusing the already mined uranium keeps new uranium from being mined, and it uses material that uh, is still part of the legacy of uranium mining in the Southwest. So uh, I think that there's lots of uranium left to be used. Uh, the new production is coming from uh, a lot of in-situ mining places and high-grade deposits in uh, Canada, Kazakhstan, uh, and uh, there's also a production still in South Africa that's by, uh, treatment of gold tailings that are reprocessed. Wow. Uh, Namibia, Niger are producing in uh, countries where there's very uh, low-cost environmental standards wow. uh, and security provided by foreign countries as well in the case of Niger. Uh, so there's plenty of production compared to existing reactor demand. Wow. Okay. The growth <coughs> in uranium is uh, speculated to be occurring because of growth in reactor construction. There are something like 443 reactors in the world, of which 104 are in the U.S. Hmm. And the U.S. has something like two uh, under uh, construction. Wow. The uh, Vodal plants that uh, President Obama has been uh, criticized heavily for providing uh, loan guarantees for those plants. Uh, that may be a, a poor investment economically, but two does not replace 104. No, it doesn't. Yeah. And all of the reactors in the U.S. are older than 38 years. Uh, Palo Verde in Arizona was the last reactor built in the uh, mid-70s. Right. So that reactor fleet is aging and not being replaced and too expensive to replace. And the boom in new reactor uh, construction is what fueled the boom here in New Mexico in the 70s when the oil majors were involved in uranium. Uh, Exxon, Mobil before they were one, uh, Conoco, Phillips before they were one, right. uh, Gulf before it was Chevron, <clears throat> all owned uranium properties and none of them developed because that commercial market was never realized because the 500 reactors that were proposed when we were young people, they wound up being just 104. Right, right, right. So the three or 400 that are proposed now, only a couple of dozen, maybe 50 are under construction. Wow. Most of them, about 300, are in the planned or proposed stage, not under construction, not operating, not funded. So it's uh, the gold at the end of the rainbow is the new reactors. That's right. what will push uranium mining regardless. And uh, the Russia is the U.S.'s partner in the blending down of nuclear weapon-grade uranium, right. which is uh, destroying uh, weapon-grade material. It's very authentic uh, non-proliferation right. to me, and it's something that was established during uh, uh, the Soviet Union period and has extended to the Russian Federation. The first George Bush established the uh, uh, megatons to megawatts program. Right. 
and Ross Adam is still in charge of the uranium in Russia. Mm-hmm. And the New START treaty, the treaty that's uh, replaced the one that had the mega tons to megawatts, it allows Russia to market the blended down nuclear fuel directly mm-hmm. to the U.S. reactor owners. They don't have to go through Russian export company to U.S. import company. And so the Russians are selling their uranium, blended down uranium, to U.S. reactors as well as, at the front end of the fuel cycle, mining uranium and selling it to different places. So the, the role of the Russian uh, vertically integrated full spectrum atomic ministry is affecting the U.S. uranium market at both ends. Right. It, it's a free country. People are allowed to do these things, but it's not very well recognized. The relationships aren't transparent and... They're worth knowing. So one last question comes to mind. If um, uh, we've all been hearing about, uh, all of us who are interested in uranium, been hearing about uh, plans to do in situ leaching into groundwater on uh, uh, certain uh, certain areas in the Navajo Reservation. Uh, in situ leaching, I would think, almost inevitably results in some kind of change, at least, if not outright pollution of an aquifer. Uh, it doesn't seem to me... I, after listening to you now, that there's any conceivable reason uh, or would serve any national purpose or, or any moral purpose to be destroying a people's groundwater to produce uranium when there's already a glut in the uranium market? Well, currently, the uranium is traded as a conventional commodity. So it's a, a marketing and development opportunity it's not a uh, national imperative for uh, energy or weapon independence. Uh, so it's uh, companies being opportunistic. Right. Uh, the uh, situation in uh, the Church Rock area is that uh, the company that owns the uranium rights, which is called HRI, and they're a subsidiary of another company called URI, and they're based in Texas, and URI has some operating in situ mines there. Uh, The company has a property that has been declared by the federal courts to be not Indian country, even though it's completely surrounded on all four sides. Uh, And so this is a donut hole in the checkerboard. Yeah. And so that's a very disappointing uh, decision for Navo Nation as well as the people living nearby. <clears throat> but uh, HRI doesn't have access to its property without crossing tribal land. Oh, I, I forgot about and that. And so the Navo Nation has, on the one hand, a Diné Natural Resources Protection Act that prevents uranium mining right. and has a settlement agreement with HRI saying that they are, will not cross that portion of the Navajo Nation land without permission wow. in exchange for the nation letting them do that one time a couple of months ago when the NRC, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, was in town and wanted to do a site visit. So the company cannot access its site. Uh, according to a set agreement which it signed with the Navajo Nation, and therefore, the company has gone to the local chapter and generated a support resolution oh. saying, Get a, go ahead with the testing as a way to put pressure on the nation oh, to go back and change its settlement and Natural Resource Protection Act. Mm-hmm. So without a uh, uh, purchaser, without a uh, offtake agreement or uh, uranium purchase agreement, URI really doesn't have much money either. They don't have the cash to develop the mine, so they're build, trying to build support. And they're represented by the same firm that uh, hosts the Uranium Producers of America. The URI is one of the American-based <laughs> Uranium Producers of America. And the, whether they're American or Canadian or whatever, they all wrap themselves in the American flag. They want to produce American uranium for America, regardless of where the income goes. <laughs> so the income income goes to Vancouver or 
Moscow or Tokyo, and the waste stays here. The community always gets the waste, and that's the long-term source of risk. Yeah. Whether that risk can be managed or contained, that's the uncertainty. Uh, trying to guarantee that waste can be managed perfectly in perpetuity. That's the uh, sell that the companies are trying to make to people who live near mines that haven't been closed and are still leaking. Thank you so much, Paul. This has been just <laughs> incredibly informative to me. What, I, what I'm hearing is, uh, is that, old, that old line, there are more things in heaven and earth that are dreamt of in our philosophies ratio. And, and uh, you know, when you talk about uranium mining and milling, you, know, you, you sort of think, you know, you dig a hole in the ground and you put some stuff in the water and that's it. But it is so richly and really frighteningly complicated with so many implications and so much tangling. It was really great to hear your untangling of a lot of these very important issues, and I hope we have a chance to, to talk again at the New Mexico Mercury. Well, I hope so, too. Uh, appreciate talking to you and appreciate your effort putting this together, and always glad to talk.